Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th annual Salmon P. Chase Distinguished Lecture, What History and the Historians Have Gotten Wrong About Salmon Chase. Please welcome John Malcolm, Vice President in the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Constitutional Government. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to the Heritage Foundation uh, for this 10th annual Salmon P. Chase Distinguished Lecture. And who better to deliver it than Walter Starr, who is the uh, author of a new book on Justice Chase. We are delighted at Heritage to be co-hosting this event with the Georgetown Center for the Constitution and with Professor Randy Barnett, who will introduce our featured speaker in just a moment. Uh, as many of you know, Randy is the Patrick Hotung Professor of Constitutional Law at Georgetown Law School, and he is also the faculty director of the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Randy is also a former prosecutor, a recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Constitutional Studies, and the Bradley Prize. And he's written a dozen books and well over 100 articles that have appeared in leading periodicals and law reviews. Please join me in welcoming my friend and one of our nation's most distinguished scholars, Randy Barnett. Well, thanks for those very kind words, John. Um, I'm really so grateful to you and Heritage uh, for, uh, for co-hosting this event with us tonight. Now, tonight is a bit of a bittersweet moment for me and for the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. Part of the Center's mission is to improve the narrative surrounding the Constitution of the United States. And as part of that mission, we try to revive the memories of unjustly neglected figures from our constitutional history. Figures like James Wilson, Governor Morris, John Bingham, Jacob Howard. So our first major activity as a center 10 years ago was to establish the Salmon P. Chase Distinguished Lecture, which was co-sponsored by the Supreme Court Historical Society and held in the courtroom of the Supreme Court of the United States. In our 10 years, our lecturers have addressed the 150th anniversary of the adoption of the 13th Amendment, the 225th anniversary of the adoption of the Bill of Rights, the life and career of Justice James Wilson, the 150th anniversary of the publication of Thomas Cooley's treatise, Constitutional Limitations, which rest upon the legislative power of the states of the American Union. The 200th anniversary of McCulloch versus Maryland, the 100th anniversary of the, 19th, uh, the adoption of the 19th Amendment, and last year's lecture on Frederick Douglass and anti-slavery constitutionalism. Our inaugural Chase Distinguished Lecture was on the lecturer's namesake, Salmon P. Chase. It was a masterful address delivered by the historian James Oakes. Tonight marks the final year of the Salmon Chase Distinguished Lecture Series, which we, which we decided to close by once again honoring the life and career of Salmon Chase, who has become, I have to say, a personal hero of mine. We are supremely grateful to the Heritage Foundation and to John for agreeing to host and co-sponsor the lecture this year. I am supremely grateful to Professor Oakes for returning to Washington to introduce tonight's lecturer, Walter Starr. Jim is one of the leading historians of the 19th century, America, and he has been on the faculty of the Graduate Center uh, at City College since 1997 and the holder of the Graduate School Humanities Chair since 1998. His many books include one I consider to be a masterpiece, Freedom National, The Destruction of Slavery in the United States, 1861, to 1865. But before turning the microphone uh, over to Jim to introduce Chase Le the Chase Lecture, I want you all to know that tomorrow night, the Georgetown Center for the Constitution will award its Thomas Cooley Prize of $50,000 to Walter for his definitive biography, Salmon Chase, Lincoln's Vital Rival. The award will be made at the Center's annual gala dinner held at the National Archives in the room where the declaration the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights are bound. Tomorrow, a group of scholars will gather at Georgetown to discuss Walter's book, as well as the 150th anniversary of, his, of Chase's dissenting opinions in both the Slaughterhouse Cases and, the, and Bradwell versus Illinois. And Walter wants us all to know that his research agenda is not ending there. He is currently at work on a similarly masterful biography of uh, Chief Justice um, Taft, Chief Justice William Howard Taft. Of course, the more I hear about Chief Justice Taft, the less I like him. But uh, <laughs> I'm sure Walter is going to remedy that circumstance. 
Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, please join me now in both congratulating Walter Starr as the recipient of the 2023 Thomas M. Cooley Book Prize and in welcoming Professor James Oakes to introduce him. Thanks, Randy. It's really nice to be back and bookending this, this remarkable series that you inaugurated 10 years ago. It's, it's always important when considering anti -slave, the anti-slavery movement to distinguish between militant rhetoric and political substance. Too many members of my tribe, my tribe being professional historians, are dazzled by the impassioned language of William Lloyd Garrison while disdaining the supposed moderation or conservatism of anti-slavery politicians like Abraham Lincoln or Simon Chase. Garrison did indeed call for the immediate abolition of slavery, something no anti-slavery politician could contemplate before the Civil War, but Garrison's immediatism was largely rhetorical. He believed the Constitution was so thoroughly compromised that Congress could do nothing, literally nothing, to undermine slavery. It couldn't protect the due process rights of accused fugitives. It couldn't ban slavery from the Western territories. It couldn't regulate the domestic slave trade. And according to Garrison, Congress could not even abolish slavery in Washington, DC. In short, Garrison's militant rhetoric rested on a bed of political passivity. As a practical project, aimed at the ultimate extinction of slavery, immediatism was essentially inert. This contrasts sharply with the anti-slavery politics of Salmon P. Chase, and nobody understands this better than Walter Starr. Maybe that's because Walter is a lawyer. He's already written major biographies of two other prominent anti-slavery lawyers, William Seward and Edwin M. Stanton. But as anti-slavery lawyers went, Chase was at the top of the heap. He did more than any other person to gather up the most valuable strands of abolitionist legal reasoning and transform them into a viable anti-slavery politics. Like Lincoln, Chase exemplifies a point I've occasionally made to students and colleagues. Conservatives sometimes make the best revolutionaries. They're more likely to resist the excesses of radicalism and less likely to let revolutions spin out of control. Better than any previous biographer, Starr traces the process by which Chase adopted an interpretation of the Constitution that, contrary to Garrison, emphasized its anti-slavery elements. Step by step, Walter follows Chase as he moved into anti-slavery politics, reformulating the Liberty Party platform to make it more appealing to voters, expanding that appeal as a free soiler, and finally working tirelessly to articulate and advertise the constitutional vision and practical politics of the new Republican Party of the 1850s. Now, neither by instinct nor by training do I espouse a great man theory of history, and so it has to be noted that Chase was not alone in what he did. Nevertheless, the point bears repetition. No man did more than Chase to build an anti-slavery Republican Party that would, in 1860, gain control of the federal government and, in so doing, make the Civil War an anti-slavery war. If that were all Chase did, his place in, history of the, in the history of the United States would be secure. But as Walter shows, Chase went on to serve as Treasury Secretary in Abraham Lincoln's cabinet and, once again, did more than any one man to secure the finances of the Union at the most financially perilous moment of the Union's history. And if that were not enough, Chase went still further to become Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, issuing a series of crucial decisions that will be the subject of tomorrow's conference. Walter Starr guides us through the lives of Sam and Chase with a firm grasp of the facts and an unerring sense of their larger historical significance. He understands the difference between militant rhetoric and genuine practical radicalism. There's a paradox here, or maybe it's just a curiosity. But Salmon Chase may be well be the most important American of the Civil War era that most Americans have never heard of. Walter's biography ought to go a long way toward correcting that. Finally, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to close on a personal note. I'm grateful and not a little relieved that 
Walter has now moved on to a later period of US history, working on his biography of William Howard Taft, thereby leaving those of us left behind in Civil War America with the few scraps left uncovered by Walter Spar's remarkable trilogy, biographical trilogy of the three, mo three of the most important anti-slavery lawyers of the 19th century. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My goodness, I, I don't know that I've ever been introduced so, so, so much and so kindly. If you ask historians about Sam and Chase, the first word that comes out of their mouth is ambitious, overly ambitious. And to some extent, they are just echoing what contemporaries said uh, in 1848, when Chase was a candidate for the US Senate seat from Ohio. Uh, one of his friends, this is a friend, writes to another that Chase was, quote, a noble man, but ambitious as Julius Caesar. And in 1868, when Chase, Chief Justice Chase, is presiding over the impeachment trial of President Andrew Johnson, a Republican paper accused him of being so fixed on securing the Democratic presidential nomination that he was both tilting the impeachment trial to secure the acquittal of Johnson and giving speeches to try to secure Southern votes. Uh, Chase, according to this article, was mad with presidential fever. And I like that so much that I used it as the title for that chapter, 1868. I admit, Chase had ambitions. One doesn't get to be the senator from Ohio, and then the governor of Ohio, and then the treasury secretary, and then the chief justice of the United States without a certain amount of ambition. But when one talks about his ambition, one has to think about how often he did things that were against his own political interests. Let's start in 1841. He is a, a leading Whig of Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, and has a promising future ahead of him. He's the, a member of the city council, and there's talk that he should be sent here to Washington as the, the US representative. But he leaves the Whig party and, and doesn't join the Democrats. No, he joins the tiny Liberty Party. The prior year, in the presidential election, the Liberty Party had received about one third of 1% of the votes. That's roughly equivalent to the Green Party in 2020. How many of you can name the Green Party candidate in 2020? Probably nobody. In other words, he was joining this tiny bunch of eccentrics. Um, and yet he did. Um, uh, or consider, for a second example, uh, what Chase did in 1845. Um, the black community of Cincinnati wanted to honor him for the legal work that he was doing for blacks, often uh, men and women accused of being fugitive slaves. And so they presented him with a little silver pitcher. It's now in a museum in Cincinnati um, and to thank him for that work. He got up and he gave a speech to thank the blacks for their uh, the pitcher. In that speech, he said, that he was um, opposed to the provision in the Ohio State Constitution that denied black men the right to vote. He said, quote, true democracy makes no inquiry about the color of the skin or the place of nativity or any other similar circumstance or condition. He went on to say that he was opposed to the state statutes which segregated the schools by race. He said that that was inconsistent with another provision of the Ohio Constitution, which guaranteed public education without any distinction or preference whatever. Those were bold statements in 1845, and Chase ensured that they were not merely heard by his immediate black audience, but read by a large audience. He had them printed up in a pamphlet. Those statements were quoted back against him when he ran for governor a few years later under headlines that said that he was in favor of black voting and integrated schools. And those headlines used a word that I cannot repeat in polite company. Um, 
historians, so one major error is this ambition point, but a different and related point is that historians often say that Chase disliked and, and abused Lincoln behind Lincoln's back. And again, to some extent, they're just echoing what people said at the time. Um, there was a, an article that appeared in a New York newspaper early in, in 1864 accusing Chase of wanting to become Chief Justice. It noted that the current Chief Justice, Roger Tawney, was 87 years old, and so it was likely that pretty soon Chase was going to have a chance to, uh, to get that seat. If, and it, it said that Lincoln had promised Chase the seat if he would drop out of the presidential race. We will soon see, the paper said, Mr. Chase supporting for re-election a man whom in his heart he despises and derides. Now, Chase and Lincoln were not close friends. They didn't sit by the fireplace and trade political stories in the way that Lincoln and Seward did. But Chase did not despise and deride Abraham Lincoln. On the contrary, he respected and rather liked Lincoln. So to take just one example, in the summer of 62, there's a political rally not far from here on the steps of the Capitol. Um, and Chase and Lincoln are sitting closer than those two chairs. They're just sitting side by side. Um, and after the first couple speeches, Lincoln leans over and whispers in Chase's ear that he thinks that he should say a few words and get rid of myself. And without waiting for Chase's reaction, Lincoln unfolds himself and cuts up and goes to the podium and gives a, a nice little speech. Chase writes in his diary that Lincoln's, quote, frank, genial, generous face and direct simplicity of bearing took all hearts. His speech is in all the prints and evinces his usual originality and sagacity. I, another example, later that year, there's a cabinet crisis and both Seward and Chase submit resignation letters to Lincoln. Chase's letter ends with the following, retiring from the post to which you call me, let me assure you that I shall carry with me an even deeper respect and a warmer affection for you than I brought with me to it. In the end, Lincoln, has, has both letters, Chase's letter and Seward's, and he puts both of them in the trash can and he keeps both of them in the cabinet. I think that's one of the greatnesses of Lincoln that he manages not merely to attract these talented men to his cabinet, but he manages to keep them in harness working uh, with him and for the American people for so long. Now, to be sure, there were times when Chase and Lincoln disagreed during the Civil War. Uh, one point of tension was emancipation. If Chase had been president, he would have issued an emancipation proclamation sooner than Lincoln. He noted in his diary in the summer of 62, uh, for example, that he raised with Lincoln for the 10th or 20th time the topic of emancipation. He could be something of a pain in the rear end when he wanted to. And in the Lincoln Papers at the Library of Congress, there's a draft Emancipation Proclamation that Chase shared with Lincoln. Uh, he would have granted immediate freedom to the slaves in certain southern states, kind of basically the southern tier of states. A different approach than that of Lincoln, whose preliminary Emancipation Proclamation, if you recall, didn't actually free anybody immediately. What Lincoln's proclamation said was that if any of the southern states were still in rebellion on the 1st of January of 63, well, then the slaves in whichever southern states were still in rebellion at that time would be freed. In theory, if all of the southern states had laid down their arms in the period between Lincoln's preliminary proclamation and Lincoln's final proclamation, those states could have rejoined the Union with their slaves intact. Um, and who knows how long it would have taken for slavery to end. Another common criticism of, Link, of Chase is that he didn't know much about finance before he became the Secretary of Treasury, and that he made serious financial mistakes as Secretary. Now, to some extent, this criticism is an anachronism. It, it sort of 
assumes that 19th century treasury secretaries had the same resume that 20th century treasury secretaries had. You know, they were the heads of Wall Street firms. If you actually look at the resumes of 19th century treasury secretaries, well, they were like that of Chase. They were lawyers and politicians. And indeed, and this is a point that nobody else has noticed, Chase had more financial and bank experience than almost any lawyer of his generation. He had served both as outside counsel for a number of banks, and he was a director of one bank, and he had an office at the bank. I mean, he basically was the general counsel of a major Cincinnati bank. So, you know, if you're looking for financial experience, that's a substantial amount of financial experience before he gets to the Treasury Department. It's not surprising that Chase made some mistakes while he was secretary, when you think of the challenges he faced. You know, before the Civil War, the annual budget of the entire federal government was roughly 50 million US dollars. I know, we, we spend that much in, in a few hours at, at present. By the time he left the department, the annual budget was more like $1 billion. So the federal spending had increased by a factor of 20. And Chase raised all that money in various ways, by borrowing from banks, by borrowing from the people through what we would call a war bond effort, and through a certain amount of inflation. Confederates, whose own finances were, of course, a disaster, appreciated the work that Chase had done in harnessing the financial might of the northern states to pay for the war. Leading Confederates complained after the war that they didn't lose the war on the battlefield. They had lost the war among the bankers and at the Treasury Department. Um, Chase's efforts ensured that the Union soldiers who fought in the Civil War were better fed and better clothed and better armed than any army in the history of the world up to that point. He was proud of his work in raising the funds that did all that, but he was even more proud of the work he did in creating a single American currency and forcing a reluctant Congress to adopt the, um, the National Banking Acts of 1863 and 64. Um, he had been thinking about this issue for a long time and writing about it. He felt that we needed a single national currency. We had, what we had was a, a, a variety of banknotes issued by banks that were chartered by states that were lightly regulated or really in some cases not regulated at all. And so if you traveled from one state to another and had a large banknote, that banknote would at a minimum be honored at a discount, but it might simply be refused. If you stored any of your personal wealth in these banknotes, you were at risk um, of having the bank go bankrupt or at risk of having accepted a counterfeit. This was the golden age of counterfeiters because with so many different notes, it was relatively easy to counterfeit. He had been, as I said, thinking about this problem for a long time, and he pushed through legislation to create a system of national banks, and that is why you know, it, it, it's true, as, as those who introduced me said, that not many people know about him, but almost every American sees his name every day. Because after he died, one of these national banks was created and named in his honor. It's called the Chase Bank. And it's, it's entirely suitable that he should be honored by the presence of a bank. In October of 64, um, after Chase has left the Treasury, um, he's a private citizen again for a few months um, in the midst of the presidential campaign in which Chase is once again out on the campaign trail campaigning for Abraham Lincoln. Chief Justice Roger Taney dies here at his Washington home. Newspapers predicted almost immediately that um, that Lincoln would name Chase as the next Chief Justice. But the president waited for a couple of months um, through the, the election campaign and until Congress assembled here in Washington to make his choice. Um, it, my reading of this, and this again is something that I think most historians get wrong, 
is that Lincoln was somewhat reluctant to name Chase and that he only did so when it became clear from his conversations with senators that any other nomination would fail. Uh, that didn't happen very often in the 19th century, but it did happen from time to time. Um, and Lincoln realized that, that the senators were just going to reject anyone else. Um, one of his friends wrote to another friend that the president keeps a grudge as well as any Christian, uh, and that he, <laughs> and that he um, only you know, relented and nominated Chase when, quote, the pressure became very general. And I think the pressure that he's referring to there is pressure from senators. I don't know if I'm allowed to, to broaden my topic slightly to include law professors, but I think law professors generally, okay, they generally rank Chase as a mediocre chief justice. And I will admit that he made some errors, notably in the legal tender cases, where he interpreted the necessary and proper clause so restrictively that he, he deemed unconstitutional the very language that he had pushed through Congress as Treasury Secretary. Indeed, by modern standards, Chase should have recused himself in that case. But overall, I would say that Chase was a good Chief Justice. Um, he was. He was the author of Texas v. White, an opinion that is still often quoted. He was on the right side of the Slaughterhouse cases and the Bradwell case, which we're going to be discussing tomorrow. He was on the right side in a case that almost nobody has heard of, um, Turner's case, in which he used the 13th Amendment to end a form of quasi-slavery in post-war Maryland. None of Chase's opinions were disasters like Tawney's decision in the Dred Scott case. Unless, of course, you agree with the two law professors who have recently argued that Chase's circuit court decision in Griffin's case should be hooted down the pages of history and purged from our constitutional understanding. The professors are quoting, without naming, Chase's friend, Senator Charles Sumner, who went not long after Tawney's death denounced Tawney on the floor of the Senate saying that he should be hooted down the page of history because of the Dred Scott decision. So what is this case, Griffin's case, which has, I don't know if you all have noticed it, but I've noticed it's been in the newspapers um, in the past few days. Um, it involved a black man by the name of Caesar Griffin who was tried and convicted and sentenced in a Virginia state court in September of 68 for assault with intent to kill. Griffin's lawyers filed a petition for habeas corpus in federal court claiming that the state trial was invalid because of the third section of the 14th Amendment, which for those of you who don't read the Constitution every night, um, that's a provision part of the recently, then recent 14th Amendment that said that those who had taken an oath to support the Constitution and then rebelled were unable to hold certain named offices, including state court judge. And indeed, the state judge in that case, a guy by the name of Hugh Sheffy, um, had been a member of the Virginia legislature before the Civil War, so he had taken an oath to support the Constitution, and then he'd been a member of the Virginia legislature during the rebellion, and he had voted to, you know, provide funds for the rebellion. The federal district judge in Virginia, a man by the name of John Underwood, agreed with Griffin, and he released him from prison. And Judge Underwood also released a number of other similarly situated prisoner. The state appealed to Chase, who was the circuit justice for the, the circuit that included Virginia. You know, our current Supreme Court justices each have a circuit for which they're responsible, but they don't actually have to go there. In the 19th century, you had to go. You had to ride circuit, and Chase's circuit took him to Virginia, and North Carolina, South Carolina, Delaware, et cetera. In May of 69, sitting as a circuit justice in um, Richmond, um, Chase reversed Underwood's opinion. His decision was based on two alternative points. First, relying on a long line of English and American cases, Chase ruled that Judge Sheffy was a de facto officer of the state and thus not 
subject to this form of collateral attack. And he wrote in his opinion that he had conferred on this issue with all the other justices while they'd been together in DC and that they all agreed with him on this. And second, and this is the point that's getting this decision into the newspapers at the moment, he ruled that section three of the 14th Amendment was not self-executing, that it needed some kind of congressional legislation to determine which state and federal officers were disqualified by their participation in the re rebellion. And about a year after Chase's decision, Congress, and again, so much of this book takes place right here on Capitol Hill, Congress passed a law of the sort Chase had in mind to, to lay out a procedure. When it came out in May of 69, um, newspapers praised Chase's decision in Griffin's case. Perhaps we can discount the praise of the Southern newspapers because they were very focused, very concerned that Underwood's decision would, would expose a whole slew of state officers and state court decisions to being overturned. But even Northern newspapers praised um, Chase's decision. Uh, the Baltimore Sun, for example, commented that, quote, no one ever supposed that the Chief Justice could have decided in any way than he has done in reversing the decision of the incompetent and partisan Underwood. And the Chicago Tribune, which is really, by this point, a pretty radical Republican paper, sets out Underwood's decision and then says, of course, of course, Judge Chase had to reverse this remarkable judgment and return the prisoners to the jails to which they had been condemned. Indeed, I have not been able to find, and I admit I've done more research on Griffin's case for this speech than I did for my book because it, it was really you know, fairly minor in the course of his um, chief justiceship. I haven't found any newspaper articles that criticized Chase's decision right when it came out. It doesn't mean that his decision was perfect, but at least the, the law professors are wrong in comparing Ch Chase's decision in Griffin's case with Tawney's decision in Dred Scott, because that decision was immediately and rightly criticized. Um, I think perhaps the most serious error that historians make about Chase is in their focus on his work during Civil War and Reconstruction. Yes, he did important work as Secretary of Treasury and then as Chief Justice. But, and, and my view on this changed during the course of writing the book. I now believe that his most important contribution to American history was before the Civil War, what, what Jim was talking about, the anti-slavery politics, how he builds up the Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party and the Republican Party um, to, to what they are in 1860. He saw that the abolitionists who focused on morals rather than politics, who questioned and indeed condemned the Constitution, uh, William Lloyd Garrison, about whom Jim spoke, famously took a copy of the Constitution and burned it at a rally on the 4th of July. Chase saw that you weren't going to get anywhere in American politics by burning copies of the Constitution. He embraced rather than um, then criticized the Constitution, and he interpreted it cleverly, as you know, a clever lawyer would, as a, an anti-slavery document. So to take just one example, the, the so-called fugitive slave clause, I say so-called because the word slave does not appear anywhere in the original Constitution. But the so-called fugitive slave clause, he said, was not a grant of authority to Congress to do anything. It was merely a compact among the states. Um, and although that argument failed when he made it in courts in Ohio, and it failed when he made it here at the Supreme Court of the United States in a fugitive slave case, I actually think he was right. When you look at where the clause is placed in the Constitution, when you look at the way in which it's worded, it's not in Article I, which gives powers to Congress. It's in Article IV, which is about provisions among the states. Um, I think this is a great example of how his work as a practicing lawyer helps him be better at anti-slavery politics because he first devises this argument in a court case and then uses it in political terms. Um, 
and, and this is just one of many examples of Chase, kind of the practical step-by-step, -step, as Jim says, the conservative, at least in terms of his, his sort of personal um, life man, who becomes you know, the most effective political leader of anti-slavery. You know, one way of, of capturing his contribution is to think about the 1860 election, the election in which um, Lincoln is elected. He, Lincoln could not have won that election without the work that Chase and others did in building anti-slavery parties from 1841 through 1861. Without that groundwork, there just wouldn't have been, there, might have, there would have been some form of anti-slavery party, but not a party that was able as the Republican Party was in 1860 to win in the Electoral College. Um, you know, Lincoln didn't secure a majority. There were it was a four-way election. He secured about 40 percent. But if you compare that with the the one third of one percent that the Liberty Party had secured in 1840, that's a remarkable achievement in the course of a mere two decades. Again, perhaps a current comparison can, can kind of bring this home to us. In 2000, in the presidential election, the Green Party candidate, Ralph Nader, received 2.7% of the votes. And as I mentioned, 20 years later, in 2020, the Green Party candidate, and by the by, for those Howie Hawkins, received a little less than one-third of 1% 1 of the vote. So. As concerned as many Americans are about climate change and the environment, the, the Green Party has not been able to translate that into political power in the way in which Chase and his friends were able to translate concern about slavery, or maybe more precisely, concern about the spread of slavery into political power in the late 1850s and 1860. Of course, Lincoln's victory in the 1860 presidential election does not end slavery. That takes a lot of further things. It requires the, the, the foolish and, in Chase's view, completely illegal decision of the southern states to secede from the Union. It requires the attack on Fort Sumter. It requires the Civil War, the Emancipation Proclamation, the decisions of thousands of blacks to leave their plantations and walk, often at great personal danger, to, um, to camps near the Union Army, and then at even greater personal danger, in many cases, to join the Union Army. In short, uh, you know, emancipation is still, in a sense, a long way away in 1860, although as it turns out, it doesn't take that long. Um, and Chase lives to see, um, you know, we, we tend, I think, in looking back at Reconstruction to focus too much on what was terrible. There were some very good things that happened in Reconstruction. By the time that Chase dies in 1872, um, not only are black Americans voting in Ohio, as he had argued they should, um, in that 1845 speech, but they're voting in South Carolina and they're sending black representatives here to Washington to serve in the halls of Congress. So he plays a central role in ending slavery in America and that is, is no small feat. Um, he deserves a, a, a central place in our history. I could stop, but I think that is probably a good enough spot for me to start a conversation with uh, Professor Barnett and with all of you who have questions. Um, well, thank you, Walter. That was um, everything I hope it would be. I have to say about you something that you just said about um, about Chase, and that is, I think your work as a historian has benefited from the fact that you're a lawyer, uh, because one of the th frustrations I have with historians of this period, Jim Oakes, um, uh, to the contrary, uh, <laughs> whose book is extremely sophisticated legally, 
um, is they just miss the legal nuances of what they're talking about because they just don't have the training to understand them. Um, and you're, and I think, therefore, I think this talk, as well as your book, uh, just greatly benefits from that. Um, I'm going to, uh, we're going to open this up to questions from the floor. I'm going to ask the first question. Um, because I want to draw your attention to an issue that you didn't address, which is uh, Chase's attitude towards the rights of women, towards women generally, women's equality, and the rights of women. Tomorrow we will be discussing the slaughterhouse cases uh, which denied that the right to pursue a lawful occupation was a privilege or immunity of citizens of the United States in the case of involving white butchers from New Orleans. And the next day after the slaughterhouse case was announced, um, it decided the case of Bradwell versus Illinois, which applied the ruling of the previous day to the, whether a woman had a right to practice law um, in the state of Illinois. And the majority said, well, we said there is no such privilege or immunity, so therefore this case is easy. If what we said yesterday is true, then this is easily decided. But of course, the dissenters in, in um, Slaughterhouse who believed that there were such a privilege or immunity were put to the test as to what how they would decide the case of women. And as you know, three dissenters uh, side, uh, sided with Justice Bradley in explaining why it was a perfectly reasonable restriction on women uh, uh, that, uh, that they should not be able to practice law, notwithstanding the fact that there was such a fundamental privilege. Chase dissents. Uh, he's just, he dissents in Slaughterhouse. He's the sole dissenter in Bradwell because he dies three weeks later after the decision is announced. He's in very ill health. He's had a series of strokes. He doesn't write an opinion other than to say in the, in the US reports that the Chief Justice in Bradwell, the Chief Justice dissents from the decision and all opinions in the case, meaning he dissents from Bradley's con concurrence, not just from the majority. Tell us what Chase could not tell us because he was too ill to write his dissenting opinion. Tell us about Chase's attitude towards women. Where did it come from? How did it manifest itself? What did, what did your historical research reveal about that? Right, well, I think I probably should back up just a little bit. I realize, as you were asking this question, that I didn't mention anything about his family life. So I should tell you a little bit about his family life. Um, he, he married not long after he got to Cincinnati and got established as a lawyer, uh, but his wife died a couple years after his marriage. Married again, second wife died within a couple of years. Married again, third wife died within a couple of years. Um, so he had, and from these three marriages, he had a total of six children, of whom four died as infants or toddlers. Um, only two um, survived to adulthood, uh, one of whom most of you have, at least those of you Civil War buffs, will have heard of Kate Chase, uh, reputedly the most beautiful woman in Washington during the Civil War, um, and certainly one of the most beautifully dressed women, uh, because her father gave her a, a large clothing budget. Um, I probably not heard of her uh, half-sister, Nettie Chase, um, but also very accomplished, uh, emerges from the letters between Chase and his daughters, that they're both you know, quite accomplished. And I think he had probably up Till the time they become young adults, he had probably relatively conventional ideas about women, and in particular, you know, the, the radical suggestion of women's voting. But in part, and I think maybe largely because of his talented daughters, he came to have what was then a minority radical view, namely that women should have the right to vote. Um, and he not only expresses this in private letters, um, but he, he says it publicly as Chief Justice of the United States. Not in a, it would have been more powerful if it had been in a, a dissenting opinion in the Bradwell case. Um, but, um, uh, and, and that wasn't you know, the issue in Bradwell. The, Myra Bradwell was not seeking the right to vote. She was very clear about that. Her lawyer said, look, you, know, you can grant her the right to be a lawyer without saying anything about whether women have the right to vote under the Constitution. Um, but I think he would have, if, if he had written an opinion, he would have said, look, the 14th Amendment protects you know, various rights, including the right to pursue a profession, and the 14th Amendment um, applies to women as well as men, and there's nothing that, um, 
that he would have noted that there was nothing in the Illinois statutes that said, you know, men who passed the bar exam said people who passed the bar exam. And are, are we really going to claim that women are not people? So I think those are some of the points that he would have made if he had written a dissenting opinion in that case. And his, his views on this issue live on. I found through my newspaper research that in the late 19th century, long after he was dead, he was being quoted by suffragists as being on their side on the issue of women's right to vote. Thanks. Um, we have about 15 minutes for a question and answer. Ken. Uh, yeah, uh, oh, I wait for the mic. Sorry. I've been instructed to instruct you. OK. Um, hi. Uh, natural rights is a theme that you uh, hit upon throughout the, your biography. Um, but I wonder whether you might develop it a bit more here. Uh, for Lincoln, it was central. And I'm not sure for Chase whether it had that centrality in his, uh, in his thinking and ultimately his, his jurisprudence. Um, so I, I think you can, if you want to readdress the uh, question of, of, of the uh, Bradwell case right. or uh, or uh, uh, blacks in general, and how uh, a robust interpretation of a 13th Amendment or right. of privileges and immunities could. Right. Um, well, I realized when you asked that question that there's another whole aspect of his life that I haven't touched on and that, that I, I should, um, which is to say that, that you know, Chase was a church-going and Bible-reading man, right? Um, he, um, believe it or not, um, he, he, as a young man, when he first goes to Ohio, he lives with his, his uncle, the Episcopal Bishop of Ohio. I don't think he really gets religion at that point. Um, but when he's at Dartmouth, there's a, a massive uh, reunion, sorry, revival, and um, uh, he is... Um, uh, powerfully converted. And throughout his life, he, he gets up in the morning and reads his Bible. Um, and I think both of his views on blacks and his views on women come very much from his sort of, you know, reading of, you know, sort of fundamental Christian doctrine. The, you know, he, you know, the, he, he is not one of the, there, there's some Southerners who in the 1850s have very creative arguments about how the Bible, you know, divides white and black. Chase doesn't read it that way at all. As far as he's concerned, um, the Bible tells us to treat all people equally. And all people means people of all colors. I, I read you that quote from his, his silver pitcher speech, which I love, about how, you know, the, the law makes no distinctions on the basis of color. Um, and that... Um, you know, he doesn't often use the vocabulary of natural law, but you can see it just sort of seeping into his, um, his thinking, and not just in his court opinions, but in his, um, his thinking about these issues before and during the Civil War. He asserts natural rights um, prominently in, his, or at the end of his, his argument in the Matilda case, which was his first um, uh, foray in defending uh, runaway slaves, and the one that was published in the pamphlet was very influential in the 1830s. And at the end of his argument, he says, um, slavery is against natural right, um, and I'm not but I'm not going to rely on that argument uh, in this case because the law is basically on our side. He said, but if to the extent the law is, is ambiguous or vague or, um, or not to be, we're not sure about it, surely the idea um, that slavery is unjust as a matter of natural rights should go into our interpretation of the law. Every benefit of the doubt should be given to this woman. Um, and so she, I think he prop, actually, that's actually the way natural law and na tended to be used uh, in those days as kind of a backstop, way, a method of, of construction when laws were, could be construed one way or the other. And he does assert that in his very, very first foray into anti slavery. And, 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 and Coming back to Capitol Hill, he repeats that point when he argues a fugitive slave case here um, before the Supreme Court. 
doesn't actually come and argue it, but he argues it in briefs, um, and, and you know the, the same point of uh, as he's saying, you know, if you're in any doubt, look at at the the, the natural law aspects of this. In, in discussing. Uh, Chase's view of race. Of course, one could be anti-slavery and still be a white supremacist at the same time, and many people were. Um, you know, see the state of Oregon, which both bans slavery and prohibits freemen from going there. Um, um, Chase's view of, 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 Af of African Americans was pretty liberal. Can you say something about that as well as, for example, what his uh, will, what his, uh, yes. what his will said? Um, he. You know, the, the, the one little speech that I described, you know, um, isn't the only time that he's, you know, face to face with a black audience or have a black client, you know, walk into his office. Um, it, and there are some things, you know, if you read all the letters and all the diary, there are some little personal remarks from time to time that, you know, wouldn't pass muster by modern standards. But, um, but if you look at sort of what he does for black people, um, and I always think it's more important to look at what people do rather than what they say, um, you know, it's really quite remarkable the extent of his, his legal representation and his political support. Uh, his will, um, he gives in his will um, $10,000 each to his alma mater, Dartmouth, and to Wilberforce University, what we would now call a historically black college, um, that was the largest amount that Wilberforce received throughout the entire 19th century. I mean, it was sort of, it saved the university. Um, so, um, I mean, there again, he, you know, is, is kind of putting his money where his mouth is to, to help with black education. He served, before that, served on the, the board of trustees of a black college, served with leading, you know, it was an integrated uh, board of trustees, about half black, half white. Uh, J.P. Hogan, uh, natural law versus using three fifths in the Constitution morally as an education standard. A free did he talk about the three fifths clause as an education standard? A sixty percent pass fail, whereas a free person would be the person who had achieved the moral authority. That way, then could apply to women becoming educated, blacks could becoming educated, and the evil would be saying someone is by race three fifths instead of whether they're achieving an education. Hmm. Um, today we're getting into a new scoring standard, which could be evil, the ESG, but does he talk about the three-fifths clause in the 14th Amendment? Doesn't it mention males? Yeah, and yes. And that, I think, is a problem. Yeah, no, he, he, he um, and that was an issue. I mean, he, he certainly um, doesn't like the, 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 the three-fifths clause, he, you know, if he had you know, been able to go back and rewrite the Constitution, you know, single-handedly before the Civil War, he would have, would have um, taken it out. Um, but I, I can't think of anything along the lines of what you're saying of, of him talking about it um, as a, a way of um, sort of discounting for the the the, the educational status. I, I should say that education was one of his sort of major goals, not just for, for black kids, but for just all kids. When he was governor of Ohio, it was one of his sort of major focuses, um, you know, sort of K through college education in Ohio was, was one of the things he pressed hard on. So unlike, unlike uh, Lysander Spooner and William Goodell, um, who claimed, uh, who read the Constitution as being anti-slavery and read every one of the provisions, including the three-fifths clause, as not necessarily referring to slavery and therefore should not be interpreted as referring to slavery, um, Chase didn't take that line. He did not take that view of the what we call the slavery clauses. He fully acknowledged, although we didn't talk about it very much because it wasn't that relevant to anything, but he, did, he fully acknowledged that what we call the references to slavery were in fact references to slavery and he didn't deny it. Uh, what he did claim um, was that the powers that the Constitution does give the federal government would have given a anti-slavery federal government all the power it needed to pretty much snuff out slavery everywhere except in one of the original states that formed the Union and put so much pressure on those states that it would have pretty much ended the slavery there as well. And that was the political platform of the Liberty Free Soil and Republican parties. Chase crafted it. And it was so obviously effective 
that I think it provides the principal motivation for Southern secession before the Republicans can take office because they've been in, con because of the three-fifths clause, they've been in control of the national government, which is why they were dubbed the slave power. It was a political thing based on the three-fifths clause. And because of that, uh, they used national power to their end, but the minute they lost that, that power, the political program that Chase had crafted was so anti effectively anti-slavery that they decided to get out while the getting was good. Um, but it says when it would be illegal. So I think, did, Sandy, did you have a question? Or was there a question, a uh, hand over here? OK, no, microphone. This will be the last question. So make it good, Sandy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd be curious about your views of Chase and the indictment for treason of Jefferson Davis and the role he played in that. Um, so for those in the audience who haven't read the book, and there are a few copies for sale, um, and I'm here to sign them, um, uh, um, he, um, Chief Justice Chase, um, whose circuit includes Virginia, it, sort of uh, on, on a number of occasions, people think, oh, the, the treason trial of Jefferson Davis is about to happen, it's about to happen, it's about to happen, but it never happens. And um, both at the time and you know, modern historians, to some extent, blame Chase for that. They say, well, you know, he didn't really push. Chase pushed back on this very hard in various ways. One of the ways that I discovered was that he penned this long letter to a friend you know, first, and it was written in the third person. You know, the Chief Justice doesn't determine when the federal government you know, initiates a case. He merely tries a case when it's presented, et cetera. Um, that becomes an op-ed in the, in the New York Tribune a couple days later. Um, Chase was very eager when the war is over to, to reunite the South and the North. And he thinks that a treason trial of Jefferson Davis or any of the other Confederate leaders would be a big mistake. And so there are a couple of instances in which he could have sort of pushed to get that treason trial on the docket. And he doesn't do that. Uh, and finally, um, towards the end of his presidency, uh, Andrew Johnson issues a, a blanket pardon that reaches even to, to Jefferson Davis. I, I personally think that. Chase was right that a treason trial of Jefferson Davis would have been a bad thing for bringing the country back together and that, um, uh, and thus to the extent that he did throw a little bit of sand in the gears, that that, that was, was the right thing to do. I thought, I, should, I realized I forgot to mention anything about your um, a response to the two unnamed law professors who have been questioning um, Chase's uh, view. Those, the, those unnamed law professors are Will Bode and Michael Stokes, Stokes Paulson. Um, and I just want to note, because I don't know if you've seen it, but um, uh, Josh Blackman, my co-author, and Seth Tillman have written a very lengthy uh, critique of um, uh, Bode and Paulson, including um, uh, uh, ardent defense of Chase is re re uh, reasoning in that case. And I, I think at the end of the day, their, their analysis is likely to uh, succeed uh, more, it'd be more successful than those of uh, Bode and Paulson. I wasn't going to say anything about it, but when when I saw my man being classed with, with Roger Tawney, and, the, and when I saw his decision, which again, you know, when it comes out, all the newspapers say, oh, this is obvious. This, you know, it didn't actually, many newspapers didn't comment one way or the other because it was, it was sort of a non-event. It was like, oh, well, of course he's going to reverse that ridiculous decision. I, I, <clears throat> I could not resist defending my man uh, when people say that he should be hooted down through the pages of history for this, um, you know, relatively, I mean, again, in the, in the great, the bigger picture of his chief justiceship, this was not, by any matter of means, his most important decision. It was, you know, um, you know, one circuit court decision out of, you know, hundreds. Well, I just want to say, Chase is my man too, and um, it has frustrated me no end that uh, his biographers, Niven, what was Niven's first name? John. John Niven and Blue, 
uh, his previous biographers had written such bad biographies of Niven in particular. It was just an atrocious biography. But be, as the editor of his papers, it gets all this attention and respect published by Oxford. Um, and yet it was, I think, pretty awful. Um, and so uh, I just have to say that you are also my man for having <laughs> written this biography of Chase, the, the biography that he deserves so much. And um, I will be eternally grateful uh, to you for having done so. And let's all thank Walter for this wonderful <laughs> lecture. And I believe there's a reception now, and you should all buy the book. Um, as when I publish a book, I think it's absolutely imperative for people to buy it. If they read it, that's also good. But buying it is, <laughs> buying it is the most is the priority. And so everyone should go out and clean out the copies of the books that we have out there for sale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So